Thanks very much for agreeing to be interviewed by the uh, World Network for Saving Children from Radiation. Um, I wanted to start off by asking you about uh, Anand Grover, who's the UN's uh, Special Rap Rapporteur, Anand Grover. Uh, on the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. Just released a report on Fukushima from his extensive visit in November 2012 and it has over two pages of recommendations. It's quite a damning report. Main, some of the main points have been reported elsewhere, but they include the Japanese government's uh, lack of real safety measures, the response system that was uncoordinated and inadequate or underutilized. Uh, the radiological emergency plans were piecemeal and inadequate. And then the ties between the Japanese government's nuclear regulatory body and the Japanese nuclear industry, particularly TEPCO, the company that owns the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear complex, were not transparent and far too close to allow for independent regulation based on the best science available. And as a result, safety was compromised. Since the accident, the Japanese government refuses to take responsibility for, for resettling people, particularly children, from areas where the long-term radiation dose exceeds internationally accepted levels. Furthermore, the Japanese government has indemnified TEPCO against further losses by underwriting the cleanup effort and other financial liabilities. This has left the Japanese people responsible for paying TEPCO's debt. In the section on, on radiation safety in school textbooks, the reported safe dose, according to the text, textbooks that are now given to Japanese children, is up to 100 millisieverts. And as the report notes, the, uh, the UN report notes, this is not consistent with the law in Japan, international standards, or epidemiological research. And then there are a host of other problems identified in the report that affect the, the physical, physical and mental health of the communities in and around Fukushima, as well as the nuclear workers in the plant in charge of decontamination efforts. So, um, first of all, what, what is your response to the findings from the UN Special Rapporteur and your knowledge of how the Japanese government has gone about um, dealing with this horrendous catastrophe that happened in March 2011? Well, from the very beginning, the uh, government has uh, uh, held back information, has uh, tried to back off from taking action, and in many ways has made the catastrophe considerably worse. And naturally, one can only be critical of that, and uh, uh, I hope that uh, uh, international and domestic pressures will lead the government to uh, uh, proceed in a more uh, constructive fashion. Uh, we should recognize that they're not alone. So, for example, uh, it hasn't been investigated closely because there's a principle which says we never investigate our own crimes, only crimes of someone else. It's an overriding principle. But there's pretty substantial evidence accumulating from Iraqi and international scientists that the levels of radiation in parts of Iraq, which have been the targets of uh, a primary uh, U.S. Uh, British attack, are extremely high. Uh, some reports from Fallujah indicate that the radiation levels are approximately a Hiroshima level. Well, we don't know in detail because it doesn't get investigated, but uh, those are questions we should be asking ourselves too. And we condemn, rightly condemn, the Japanese government for not taking measures that it should. Uh, the, uh, the, there's many uh, consideration, things to think about, including ourselves. And of course, uh, the U.S. role in radiation in Japan uh, mm -hmm. need not be discussed. We should, but we should know about it and think about it and want to do something about it. Uh, on, the other, but on the specific issue, uh, every measure, of course, should be taken to uh, ensure the safety of the children and to take uh, positive steps towards uh, either eliminating uh, nuclear power efforts entirely or else at least ensuring that the highest standards are, are maintained and pursuing them. Yes, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned Hiroshima because according to the UN's report, uh, the, the amount of radioactive cesium released by the Fukushima Daiichi meltdowns was 168 times that released in the Hiroshima bombing. And yet there are 300,000 children living in the radioactive areas in Fukushima prefecture. Uh, 
the mandatory evacuation standard in Japan is set lower than that of the Chernobyl disaster. Um, and it seems that uh, the Japanese government, as you mentioned, is not currently taking its responsibilities seriously with regard to helping people relocate, making sure that they can relocate, economically speaking, and so on, particularly the question of children, which is related to the legal case that is being pressed against the Japanese government by the um, World Network for Saving Children from Radiation. Well, I think, I you know, obviously think the Japanese government should do more, but I think we should as well. Uh, it's a, uh, the use of nuclear power is an international responsibility. Uh, nuclear power is being used uh, because of uh, the uh, extraordinary damage caused by fossil fuels and the lack of, in the J Japan's particular case, the lack of direct access to fossil fuels that uh, imposes a, a severe responsibility on the wealthy countries to uh, vastly expand their uh, research and development and uh, efforts uh, with regard to sustainable development, which will uh, reduce the uh, threat of uh, disasters like this. And, uh, and of the threat to the children, of course, that uh, should be a primary concern right now. So it's a broad responsibility. It's fine for, say, me to criticize uh, the Japanese government for its failures, which are substantial, but uh, there's more urgent tasks for you and for me. Right. In fact, the International Atomic Energy Agency is in cooperation now and part of the cleanup and the health issues in Japan, and yet they are this, this agency is at the same time responsible for promoting nuclear, nuclear power. Well, that's a tricky issue. In fact, uh, some of the uh, most prominent and active climate scientists, like James Hansen, for example, actually are in favor of pursuing nuclear right. power arguing that with all of its dangers, it's, which are not slight by any means, uh, the alternatives could be a lot worse. Uh, fossil fuels are, have a devastating impact on life. Uh, the real alternative would be uh, developing sustainable options for energy, maybe some others, uh, and that requires uh, substantial efforts which are uh, much too limited. So, um, I mean, in the, the history of the world, Japan is the only country to have suffered a, a nuclear attack, and it was under occupation from the US until 1954. Um, and yet, it's also a country that is, at the same time as developing nuclear power, it has 54 nuclear power stations, um, it is a highly geologically active. And so much of the nuclear technology in Japan was a product of U.S. technology, uh, Westinghouse and General Electric. What, to what extent do you believe the original decision to develop nuclear power in Japan was a Japanese decision versus a question of what the U.S. thought was best for the development of the country? Well, Japan was very much under U.S. influence, of course, and under direct occupation and remains under U.S. influence. So, for example, when uh, just a couple of years ago, when the Japanese uh, prime minister uh, dared to raise the question of uh, removing U.S. bases from Okinawa, where the population has been struggling against them for years, he was pretty quickly ousted under U.S. pressure. Uh, so, yes, the U.S. role was significant. However, we have to ask what the options were. Uh, right after the Second World War, the U.S. made great efforts to shift uh, both Europe and Japan to uh, use of uh, fossil fuels, of oil particularly. That was a, essentially a U.S. Not monopoly, but pretty close to it. And the thinking was explicit. Uh, uh, George Kennan, one of the leading planners, uh, pointed out that what was then secret, not declassified documents, that uh, the, if the United States can maintain control over the major energy resources of the world, primarily in the Middle East, it will have what he called veto power over Japan, uh, because it'll have a kind of a stranglehold that will require our oil. Uh, well, you know, th there were other alternatives then as there are now, and they should 
they're much more obvious now than they were then. But the choice of nuclear power was in part a reaction to this. It's one of the ways of escaping. Japan, of course, has no immediate fossil, does not have rich fossil fuel resources, some coal, but not much. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, the Second World War was in the Pacific was uh, one major factor of it was Japan's effort to gain access to the uh, fossil fuels of Southeast Asia, the oil of Southeast Asia, after the what are called the, uh, the ABCD countries: America, Britain, uh, China, uh, uh, Dutch uh, had closed, and uh, France had closed off the empires. In the early 1930s, the imperial systems were closed. Uh, so, because in an effort to protect the West from rising Japanese competition and uh, Japan reacted uh, very brutally by uh, trying to conquer those resources that led to the Second World War. And after the war, uh, the U.S. plan was to uh, restore Japan's empire, to provide Japan with what Kennan called an empire toward the south. In other words, essentially restore Japan's new order, but under U.S. control. And that meant the U.S. would maintain what Kennan called veto power over it. And within that context, there was a turn to nuclear fuel. So there's many factors that should be considered when we think about this. Uh, the real option, and I think most knowledgeable scientists and others would agree with this, is uh, to find alternatives to destructive uh, energy resources, and that includes fossil fuels and nuclear energy, and that means looking elsewhere, maybe solar energy and other sources. And um, which brings us forward to today, because uh, Japan has a sizable stockpile of plutonium as a result of its civilian nuclear power operations, and there are some elements within Japanese political society who want to overcome, overturn the, the ban on nuclear weapons develop nuclear weapons. The United States is saying you're safe under our nuclear umbrella, which has been their policy since the Second World War. Um, and yet there are increasing tensions in the region vis-a-vis -a, -vis a more assertive China. Um, I wonder how that, or in your view, plays out in terms of when, what is going on now. When the U.S. says you're safe under our nuclear umbrella, that begs a lot of questions. Actually, the nuclear umbrella is extremely hazardous. It's uh, practically led to destruction of the United States. And it's worth remembering that states do not, uh, contrary to what you read in their national relations theory, states do not take security as a high priority. Uh, you can easily show that. So just take uh, U.S. history. U.S. is in the lead on this, so it's the most important country. And it's also an unusually open society, so we have a lot of evidence. But just take a brief look at the record. Uh, which includes Japan. Uh, in uh, the early 1950s, uh, the United States had extraordinary security, I mean, enormous power, half the world's wealth, uh, just incomparable security. There was one potential threat, uh, ICBMs with uh, uh, hydrogen bomb warheads. Uh, they didn't exist, but they were a potential threat. Mm -hmm. Well, the Russians knew that they were far behind the U.S. In, uh, technology and technology of war making. So they actually offered a, to, to, uh, a treaty to the United States to ban these uh, destructive weapons. How did the U.S. react? Well, we know. There's a highly authoritative uh, history of nuclear weapons uh, written by McGeorge Mundy, the National Security Advisor for Kennedy and Johnson. He had access to a rich array of internal documents. He writes more or less in passing that uh, he could not find a single document, paper, that even considered the possibility. So the idea of even considering the possibility of saving yourself from total destruction didn't arise because other factors were, issues were more important. We go 10 years beyond that, say 1962, uh, John F. Kennedy was willing to face a subjective probability, his own judgment, of a third to a half of nuclear war, which would have been massively destructive, uh, in order to establish a principle 
the principle was that the United States has the right to have offensive nuclear weapons everywhere, and no one else has that right. That was the principle, if you look closely. And in order to establish that, it's willing to face nuclear war. That involved Japan. Uh, right before the Cuban Missile Crisis, six months before, uh, Kennedy had sent uh, 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 long, long range ICBMs, long-range missiles, to Okinawa with nuclear warheads. That was threatening China at a period of great tension in Asia. There was a major conflict developing between India and China. Well, that would have brought uh, uh, destruction to Japan. That was 1962. You go on to 10 years later, 1973, Henry Kissinger called a nuclear alert. And what was the reason? Now, the reason was that there was a, a war in the Middle East, Israel Arab War. Uh, Russia and the United States had made an agreement to impose a ceasefire, but Kissinger secretly advised Israel that they didn't have to observe the ceasefire, they could continue and the nuclear alert was intended to warn Russia to stay away. Uh, a nuclear alert, of course, everyone knows. Mm -hmm. you know? So that's 1973, well, we'll go another 10 years. Uh, uh, Ronald Reagan is in office, and his administration decided to test Russian defenses by simulating nuclear attack on Russia uh, with, uh, you know, advanced bombers and so on. And the Russians didn't entirely understand what was going on. They didn't know whether it was real or simulated, so they called a major alert. We came pretty close to war. Uh, we can go on right till today. Right. Uh, just In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, about months ago, uh, if, if, actually, if you listen to President Obama's last speech, the big speech on uh, shifting nuclear uh, global uh, the pivot to no, Asia. Yeah, well, more than that, the new, new uh, 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 military policy that he announced a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there was an interesting sentence in it. Uh, he said that our assassination, he didn't call it that, the, but the assassination of Osama bin Laden, he said, carried dangers and uh, threatened our relations with Pakistan. Well, you take a look beyond that, it's much more than that. Uh, the Navy SEALs who were sent in to assassinate bin Laden uh, were under orders to fight their way out if they had to. If they had had to, the whole weight of U.S. military force would have entered. And Pakistan has a professional army mm -hmm. dedicated to the defense of the sovereignty of the country. They have nuclear weapons, probably laced with jihadi elements. Uh, the chief of staff of Pakistan was informed about the intrusion and uh, mobilized forces. He thought it was from India. Uh, General Petraeus in Kabul mobilized U.S. forces, scrambled U.S. planes. Came pretty close to a war which could have grown into a nuclear war. This was in order to carry out an assassination in someone else's territory. Now what this tells us, and it's easy to go on, is that being under a nuclear umbrella is a threat. It's not security. It's a major threat. Now, these are weapons that can instantly destroy everything. They're under the control of uh, uh, leadership elements that do not regard security as a high priority and never have, and are willing to take uh, serious risks. And so the very existence of these weapons is uh, major threat to survival. And in fact, there is a legal obligation, if anyone cares, uh, uh, determined by the uh, World Court, that the nuclear powers have a legal responsibility to live up to their uh, 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 conditions under the Non-Proliferation Treaty to mm -hmm. make good faith efforts to eliminate these destructive weapons. So talk about a security uh, blanket, I think, is extremely misleading. Um, how do you uh, compare the reporting uh, on the Fukushima disaster, thinking back to the reporting around Chernobyl in the nineteen around Chernobyl in the nineteen eighties? Do you see significant differences? Yeah, well, Chernobyl was re regarded correctly as a major crime of the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. and more reason to 
uh, condemn the evil empire for its crimes. Uh, you can argue about whether it's comparable, but it's certainly pretty awful. And the reason is it's an ally, in fact a client. Uh, we should be much more honest about that. And as I say, we should uh, always look in the mirror and ask what, what our responsibility is and what we can do about it. And I think we can do a lot. How do you think we could best uh, place pressure on the Japanese government? Because similarly in Japan, it's not being reported. There are lots of problems already starting to see health effects of, of children in the region, women who are pregnant at the time of the nuclear disaster. Uh, they didn't have a proper evacuation plan, so some people stayed in uh, highly irradiated, irradiated areas as the plume came across beyond the 20 kilometers uh, ex exclusion zone that people were evacuated from, but they were not evacuated in the direction that the plume was traveling, so they were irradiated for over a month and they stayed there, not being told to be evacuated. Um, and very little of this has been reported in the mainstream Japanese media in a similar way that it's not really reported hear about crimes of the US government and I wonder what we could do um, to help force the issue into the open with regard to what's going on in Japan because um, when I was over there many people were extremely concerned with they were not getting the correct information from the Japanese government their health concerns were not being taken seriously they were very um, the UN report talks about not just the physical welfare and health of the people but also their mental health. Some people were moved multiple times, some people up as 10 times to different emergency centers. Very dislocating, older people were moved all over the country. Uh, 100, 110,000 people are still in evacuation centers around, have not been able to move back. Uh, and yet Kuriyama city, which is the second biggest city in Fukushima, is there's, there's over 300,000 children still in the area of Fukushima who are in areas that are above one millisievert and the Japanese government is saying we don't need to do anything about that and the Japanese media is, is following that line. What, what do you advise over in Japan that they can do and also here with respect to uncovering well, the, the media kind of blackout of the story? Like many other media blackouts, we can try to put pressure on the media to report it. We can support the uh, domestic groups in Japan that are protesting it and trying to gain some, uh, 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 make some progress in dealing with the issues. We can pressure our own governments to provide uh, aid and assistance to carry out the very substantial task of uh, proper relocation and resettlement. And beyond that, we can pressure our own governments, which you should be doing independently of Fukushima, to uh, 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 take very seriously, far more seriously than they're doing now, the task of uh, developing alternative sustainable energy systems which will cut back the use of uh, uh, destructive technologies, which won't leave us with the awful choice between nuclear energy and fossil fuels. Um, and just to kind of finish on that question, because as you mentioned earlier, James Hansen who has really brought to light uh, from the late 1980s the question of climate change and global warming that we're currently worsening as CO2 levels continue to increase, the use of fossil fuels continues to increase, um, and more extreme forms of energy are being utilized so that the US has gone from being worried about running out of natural gas to having a glut of natural gas on its hand and oil. Um, and is predicted to rival Saudi Arabia by 2020 or so in terms of its ability to get more oil out of the ground. Um, what are some real alternatives? Because James Hansen is very much in favor of nuclear power, which um, is surprising when you see not only the effects of Fukushima that are going to go on for decades, um, that could happen at any time at any of the other 400 odd plants around the world. Uh, the nuclear industry is very much in favor of expansion, of course, and there are any number of arguments, not just on safety, but also on economics, that there's no way that nuclear power could be an answer to uh, electricity generation. Um, 
And of course, once you build a nuclear power plant, they're so huge that they practically and they have to be run all the time. They require you to justify them by ramping up energy use. So there's out of the window goes any concept of energy conservation. And that was quite um, noticeable in Japan when they closed all 54 reactors, 30% of the electricity supply, there were no blackouts and Japan continued. Uh, and in, in other words, they didn't need the nuclear power reactors in, in one sense. Well, um, the question is what they used to replace, replenish right. the energy. So they, they practiced a lot of conservation, but moving forward, how could Japan realistically move away from fossil fuels, move away from uh, nuclear power? Because the Japanese government now is investing heavily in uh, the extraction of methane cl clathrates, frozen methane deposits, which are supposed to rival fossil fuels by two to one. Yes. Um, in fact, it's very dangerous. In, in, incredibly dangerous. So they seem to be going in exactly the opposite direction. Well, I think, uh, um, what do you think is the answer, then? Well, I don't know Mr. Hansen personally, but I suspect he'd agree with everything you said. Uh, I understood his statements to be saying, uh, look, we have an immediate choice between two awful alternatives, and we have to evaluate and see which is worse. And he thinks, maybe he's right, that fossil fuels are worse. But that doesn't mean we're restricted to the two alternatives. There are many other things that could be done. Mm -hmm. uh, take, in fact, what's, I mean, take, say, the United States, richest country in the world, enormous advantages, Canada, pretty much the same. They are in the lead internationally in trying to destroy the environment. Right. They're in the lead. No. Do they have to be? No. I mean, in the United States and Canada, for example, there's lots of things that can be done very simply, in fact, like weatherization of homes, which would, first of all, uh, be a big shot in the arm for the economy, put a lot of unemployed people to work, mm -hmm. would very uh, sh sharply restrict the use of energy, would improve living conditions, would uh, save wasted resources, uh, all sorts of advantages. It's already been done in many places, like in England, not here, uh, or simply uh, but we do not have to leave it to China to be in the lead in developing advanced, technologically advanced solar panels. I mean, it's kind of grotesque. Uh, and are they the best approach? Well, maybe so, maybe not. I'm not technically competent to judge, but I know there are proposals right here in this institution, in fact, from engineers, and somebody else would have to evaluate them uh, to. Uh, uh, use solar energy with uh, 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 collectors outside the Earth's atmosphere that would use microwave transmission to bring power to Earth. Is it feasible? Well, I'm not the one to judge, but these are the kinds of uh, uh, options that should be pursued seriously. And uh, the resources are available, the, uh, and in fact they're being cut back, like right at this moment. Mm. Uh, research in the United States is being reduced. It's being reduced because of uh, pressures in Congress to cut back scientific investigation. And that's happening across the board. Uh, the, uh, the, a couple of weeks ago there was uh, an issue of Science Magazine, the main science journal, uh, which had uh, uh, three interesting news items in it. One was that uh, uh, measure, new measures of the ocean temperatures showed that they were higher than they'd ever been. The second was uh, uh, a technical study on the new discoveries about the extreme dangers of kind of reaching a tipping point with the use of fossil fuels. The third news item was from Congress. The House of Representatives has three committees concerned with energy, and they had picked the new chairs of the three committees, all uh, uh, climate change deniers, uh, two of them with uh, long-standing ties to the fossil fuel industry. Now that's the richest and most powerful country in the world. I mean, if we're going to, if we're not going to take the lead, and worse, if we're going to lag way behind, uh, then the chances of avoiding the horrible choice between fossil fuels and nuclear energy are very slight. So there are things we can do right this minute 
Uh, there are major efforts in the United States to turn this into uh, what's sometimes called the stupid nation uh, that is insisting on moving as rapidly as possible towards you know, what the proverbial lemmings do. Let's race toward the cliff. And that's what we're doing. I mean, actually, of uh, uh, roughly a hundred relevant countries, the United States is the only one that does not even have a national policy on uh, uh, energy conservation and uh, uh, or or of uh, 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 the use of uh, um, sustainable energy it has random policies scattered around, but no national policy. Every other country does, and we should be in the lead, not lagging mm -hmm. behind. And I think those are the. It, we should certainly be doing, making every effort to support the popular groups in Japan that are concerned with their immediate and overwhelming problem of saving hundreds of thousands of children and uh, overcoming this disaster. But at the same time, we should be looking inwards and asking why we are making, why are we in the lead in making the problem worse, much worse, and leaving people like James Hansen with this terrible choice. Mm -hmm. It seems to um, ask one final question about that and broaden it out further. The various countries around the world, uh, despite the ongoing horrendous catastrophe in, in Fukushima that is not being dealt with appropriately by the Japanese government, according to the UN and many others, um, and the clear links between nuclear power and nuclear weapons, and then the question of how do we move forward in terms of re reducing CO2 levels back down to what they've been now that they exceed uh, their, their highest level in three million years. Um, what is it? I mean, everybody lives on the same planet and yet the people who are making the decisions, the politicians at the, at the top and obviously the corporations that they seem to answer to more than their own people who elect them, uh, what is it? systematically that seems to drive them towards solutions that are false and continue down this path that the best science tells us is essentially suicidal in terms of civilization, biodiversity and so on. Well, we, Do you think it's possible within the confines of capitalism to um, move to a completely different energy paradigm? Well, capitalism is a death sentence and you can, uh, you can almost prove a theorem about it. I mean, we don't actually have capitalist systems, we have kind of mixed systems of various sorts. But to the extent that the capitalist market principles prevail, and there's substantial though, extent, they are a death sentence for well-known reasons. I mean, the, if you're the CEO of a corporation, you have a legal institutional requirement to maximize uh, profit and uh, market share. In fact, that's a legal responsibility. Uh, there are what are called externalities in the economics literature. Uh, they get a footnote here and there. Uh, the externalities are that in uh, a market transaction, say you sell me a car or something, we don't take account of the effect on, on her. We take account of our own welfare. Well, you know, sometimes the externalities, uh, the externalities are always significant. Uh, but sometimes they're uh, horrendous. Uh, uh, so take the current financial crisis. Uh, that's substantially reducible to a mar to a well-known market fa an inherent market failure, inherent, namely when financial institutions make risky transactions, they do not take into account what's called systemic risk, the risk that the whole system will collapse. That's an externality, so you disregard it. But there's a much worse one the fate of the species. That's not taken into account in principle in market transactions. So to the extent that these institutions continue to function, it's a death sentence. Uh, they're driven to try to destroy the species. So you know, it's kind of hard to blame the CEO of ExxonMobil for uh, trying to destroy the planet. It's his legal responsibility under the existing institutional structures. I don't think that makes him a nice guy, but uh, we might as well realize where the fault lies. And that has to do with uh, what you mentioned before, the relation between decision-making and popular opinion.
uh, the relation is very slight. Uh, there is also really existing democracy, which I mean, there have been debates over the years about whether democracy and capitalism are compatible, kind of abstract debate. It's a very concrete question. Is really existing uh, capitalism compatible with democracy? The answer is right in front of us, certainly not. Uh, we live in a plutocracy, not a democracy. And the evidence for this is overwhelming. Uh, the uh, large majority of the population literally has no influence on policy, doesn't matter what they think. Uh, if you look at public uh, studies of public opinion, which are very extensive in the United States and well done, uh, you find that uh, the most, what I think you and I would agree, are the most destructive policies, both economically, uh, uh, ecologically, and so on, are much more strongly supported as you move up the wealth and income level, for good reasons. These are people who will gain from them in the short term. Their children may die, but they'll gain in the short term. And that's true pretty much across the board. And they're the ones who make the decisions in a plutocracy, not the population. And furthermore, there are major efforts made by the powerful institutions to try to create a stupid tension. So just to give you one example, the, there is an organization, American Legislative Exchange Council, corporate funded organization, which develops uh, uh, legislation for state legislatures. And they got a lot of money behind them, so they have a lot of clout, and most of them go through. You can imagine what they are. One new one that they're starting is for schools, K-12. to uh, The program is uh, to try to introduce what they call uh, critical thinking into schools. Sounds nice. What's critical thinking? It means balanced education. So if in sixth grade you teach what say 99% of scientists believe, you also have to teach to balance it what Senator Jim Inhofe believes, mm -hmm. you know, that there's nothing happening. That's balanced education. Well, the idea is to try to create a very stupid nation which will continue to support, which will support the drive to destruction, which is institutionally required uh, by the way our institutions are constructed. So it's a big, there's a lot to dismantle here. Mm -hmm. It's not just let's put money into developing Lots solar energy, but let's ask what structures we live in that are driving us to destruction. Right. Um, I, I was very heartened on the, uh, a positive note, very heartened by the growing movement in Japan of ordinary people to challenge their government en masse with huge demonstrations, tens of thousands, and not just in Tokyo, but all around the country, demanding the end of nuclear power and, and a new, not just a, a new way of generating energy, but a much more transparent government, more answerable to the people because the connections between the corporations and the government, particularly the nuclear corporations, the so-called nuclear village, was so intense. Something that we um, saw recently in with the BP 2010. Well, since I like, I, I always think we should look to ourselves. Mm -hmm. There's a reason for that too. Uh, after the Second World War, uh, the United States of course occupied Japan and controlled it. Uh, the first couple of years after the war, the uh, proconsul who basically ran it was General MacArthur. And MacArthur probably believed what he was taught in eighth grade civics. So he allowed Japan to move on a course of democratization. And it was pretty significant. There were quite important developments in, uh, in reaction to Japanese fascism happening all over Japan. When the liberals in Washington discovered that Japan was being democratized, they were appalled. And they instituted what was called the reverse course to impose upon Japan uh, essentially corporate rule, much like here. And it was done. They had the power to do it. So this connection that you're mentioning maybe it would have developed anyway, but it developed with mm -hmm. uh, direct U.S. initiative under U.S. control. Something similar happened in Europe, and of course it happens here. Uh, so uh, our hand is everywhere for good reasons. It's a rich, powerful country, uh, most powerful in history. Uh, 
uh, and uh, has enormous impact on what happens. So it makes sense to take a look at all of these issues and ask, what have we done about it? What can we do? There are always good answers to that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for the interview. Yeah.